You're listening to Booked, where two guys talk about their books they're reading. I'm your host, Mr. Frank. And I'm your host, Mr. Livius. Uh, and this week, we're going to be reviewing Terror Mannequin by Douglas Hackel. Um, Frank actually brought this book to, to my attention. Frank, how'd this, uh, how'd this get on your radar? Uh, I've been a long-term fan of Douglas Hackel's work, and he just came out with this brand new book, and, and I had an opportunity to bring it right here to Booked to challenge the Booked audience with this new Douglas Hackle offering. Some of you may be asking yourselves, something seems a little off about the podcast tonight. Do you feel like something's a little off, Frank? I don't know. It feels very natural to me this evening. Uh, I'm picturing somewhere that Rob is like living out his worst nightmare, that somehow he's been completely erased from this podcast and, and replaced by a longtime friend, Frank Edler. Uh, <laughs> Rob took a, took a couple weeks off. So we were going to bring you an episode last week, but uh, it didn't work out that way. So Rob was down visiting with podcast friends, Misty and Jesse um, in Texas. He brought his equipment with him, but we just couldn't get it to, to work right in his non-natural habitat. So we did chit chat for an hour. You guys just don't get to hear it. And then this week, Frank was courteous enough to read a book and prepare to talk about it with me. So thanks a lot, Frank. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And I am wearing spiritually a, a Kangle hat uh, in honor of Rob's uh, missing seat here. I believe you. I totally do. <laughs> um, here's Frank's bio, because Frank is also a writer and, and he hosts a podcast. So Frank J. Edler resides in New Jersey, where he attempts to write. He is the author of Scatterbrain, Brats in Hell, Death Gets a Book, and Scared Silly. He is the co-author of the Shocker Trilogy. His work walks the fine line between horror, humor, and weird fiction. When he is not writing, Frank is the host of Bazong, the weird and wacky fiction podcast. That's me. Dude, how many episodes? See, you're, you were, I don't know, smarter or whatever. Like, you don't number your episodes because I tried to look it up. And I scrolled yeah. and scrolled and scrolled and scrolled forever. And I was like, there's like 3,000 episodes. But do you have a, a slightly more or accurate number? I believe right now I, uh, I am at 181, 182, somewhere right in there. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, so uh, it's been probably about four years. Am I, am I close on that, that you've been doing Bazaar? Definitely three. Uh, 2014, I think I kicked it off. Um, no, it must have been. Two, I actually recorded the first episode December of uh 2014 so it, it started uh the beginning of Jan january 2015 all right um before that books beer and bullshit which still comes up from time to time on the book podcast that was uh one of my one of my favorites we won't ask any questions about what happened there whatever we'll just let it lie <laughs> the way it is um but tonight we're here to talk about uh douglas hackle so i'm going to give you the the bio i'm going to be honest there's a different bio that came with the book but there's a particular reason chose to read this bio. Mm -hmm. Douglas is the author of Is Winona Ryder Still with the Dude from Soul Asylum and Other Lurid Tales of Terror and Doom, Clown Tear Junkies, and The Hottest Gay Man Ever Killed in a Shark Attack. A selection of his short fiction is also included in the Bizarro Starter Kit Red from Eraserhead Press. Terror Man, Terror Face, Terror Clown, Terror Child, Terror Man, Terror House, Terror Shark, Terror Mouse, Terror Anvil, Terror Tater, Tot, Tra la 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 la. That last part there, that's that's why I chose this one over the one that's in the book. That that is a very, very Douglas Hackle biography that you chose to read yeah i like i actually like it i mean i don't want authors to start doing that at the end of their bios <laughs> but i think for for this one time that worked out uh that worked out pretty well terror mannequin is about a 40 year old glant lamont is a longtime employee of fun for life corporation where he gets paid good money to play video games watch tv get drunk get high devour pizza ride the company roller coaster take long ass naps and toss off like a madman in an insane asylum. There's only one problem. Glant's sick of his job. Nowadays, all he really wants to do is work long, grueling shifts, seven days a week, doing any sort of awful, back-breaking, tedious, demoralizing, soul-crushing, severely undercompensated labor. But with Halloween just a few days away, Glant has more important things to worry about than his workplace woes. Namely, he must take his two freak nephews out reverse trick-or-treating, 
which is a form of annual ritualistic tribute whereby the cruel townspeople force his nephews to walk door to door on Halloween night to hand out candy to people instead of receiving candy themselves. And this year, the last stop on the trio's reverse trick-or-treating itinerary is Falling Water. Built on a natural waterfall, Frank Lloyd Wright's famous architectural masterpiece is now closed to the public and allegedly haunted by an evil supernatural entity known as Terror Mannequin. Yeah. I'm going to be honest, because mm-hmm. we talk about the uh, the synopsises um, quite a bit here on board. And I, I didn't read the synopsis beforehand, which I usually don't do. I mean, if I already know I have to review a book, I don't even bother um, getting it. I, I'm going to say that this one is, like, it's accurate. Like, there's nothing misleading about the synopsis. But I feel, and I, I want to talk about this later, about even the title of the book. Um, I feel... Like the biggest part of the book isn't in the synopsis, which is a little a little odd. Yeah, and I don't know. Perhaps as we break it down, there's a reason for that. It may lose the reader to try to explain that all out. <laughs> I, I I definitely agree with you on that. I'm going to get it started with with a, a little bit of the story. So um, it kicks off with the prologue that takes place way 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 back in 1989. Um, when I was just a young Livius and Mr. Frank was a young Mr. Frank. Um, and it's uh, it's Halloween night and the kids are trick or treating. So a little bit about this uh, world famous masterpiece. Um, it, it, as it says in the synopsis, it sits on a natural waterfall. Um, but the, the big treat for the town was that you would go and you would get into these little boats that were provided. And, and that was like essentially one of the last stops you would make is you would ride down the river and there was some type of gate system installed where the river would turn into like a dock at this man's house, kind of like an underground dock. Mm-hmm. And you would get your trick-or-treating candy from him. It's elaborately decorated and stuff. And then you would leave. Uh, on this night in 1989, two things occur. Terror Mannequin, which <laughs> I'm going to actually let Frank talk about <laughs> the character of Terror Mannequin because <laughs> it's fucking batshit crazy. Um, appears for the first time, um, and and that causes uh, that mechanism to um, to fail, and a number of families go over a waterfall to their death. So you want to tell you want to explain a little bit to folks what Terror Mannequin is? Terror Mannequin, as as we first <laughs> are introduced to it, it's a it's a I don't know what you call it a conglomerate of. Uh, mannequins it's it well it's it's a mannequin who has in its lap a ventriloquist dummy and in the ventriloquist dummy's lap is a a wax doll and in the wax doll's lap is a a voodoo doll and in the voodoo doll's lap is a a jack-in-the-box with its hand on the crank ready to turn and then when and then when the well i don't know i guess maybe we should See if that surprise will come out of the jack in the box, and really, but it's one, it's one single entity, the terror mannequin, but it's it's compo- comprised of all four of these things. So, I mean, immediately when we see terror mannequin, we get the first introduction of of the batshit craziness of of Douglas Hackle's world. Bat shit crazy indeed. And it's funny because the rest of that prologue where he's introduced is written yes, um, pretty straight. It's like fairly, really straight with this fucking insane thing. It just occurred to me. I was saying like Rob is sitting listening to this. And it's like his worst nightmare. And he just heard that description of Terror Manic. And he's like, I'm so glad I didn't have to read that book. Fuck. It's like, what? you know, I don't think Rob would have been on board for this one. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, so essentially we're left with uh, all these families dying and Terror Mannequin is out in the world. So we fast forward all the way to, um, I want to say today, but I feel like it's slightly in the future from today based on some of the things that, that come up in the story. But uh, Terror Mannequin is now legendary. So this is this is the boogeyman of, of this town, which we'll talk a little more about, but it's Salosa. Um, Pennsylvania. I don't believe that's a real town in Pennsylvania. I have reason to believe that might be a fictional place. (laughs) Um, And that's where we catch up with uh, with Glant Lamont and uh, and his work at the Fun for Life Corporation. 
and Gallant is is as the synopsis uh, says he it's it's a dream job essentially by most people's standards you know you can sit around do nothing uh there there's roller coasters if you if you just sit there and do absolutely nothing all day the boss doesn't care if the boss catches you doing work you get uh berated and are encouraged to fuck off and uh and but this is uh you know an upside down world where glant is he's uh, incensed by that he wants he wants a real job in the real world where it's just uh you're, you're the slave to the grind and and uh you're under the the man's thumb all, constantly so uh, despite this being everybody's real dream job for glant it's 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 absolute torture and his boss is uh <laughs> very treats him extremely poorly I see where where Douglas is going with this, right? So this is that that picture that we see. If you ever see like a like a tech startup in California, you know where where the whole place is nothing but pool tables and pinball machines, and you know they have lunch catered in every day. But uh, this being uh, squarely a, a Bizarro book, that that's that's really ramped up a little bit. Like one of Glant's coworkers just is dressed like an adult baby all the time, and then you know it has other people change his diaper through the course of the day. Some people are just like shooting up heroin at their desk and watching YouTube all day. So it's it's taken to that bizarro level of what some of these startups are. I mean, I'll be honest. I have a friend who a very close friend who just, uh, you know, was was uh, did a, an interview with a place. I don't understand how this works exactly, but you have unlimited paid time off. Unlimited paid time off. Yeah, like like there's no cap. I, I think like if you get your work done and you want to take that extra vacation, like it's cool. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's quite fun for life. Like, you know, maybe you don't have to show up for months <laughs> at a time or, or anything like that. Right. But I, I definitely see where he was going. And he took that uh, clearly to the most absurdist level uh, that he could. Mm -hmm. And he spends quite a bit of time in fun for life, which I'll be honest. At first, I was like, oh, God, like the thing with Bizarro books is this. I, I've read. I don't know, a dozen maybe like true, like bizarro books. Right. They always take me so long to get into because there's that adjustment period where you've just read the most ridiculous thing you've read in months. But then three paragraphs later, you read something even more ridiculous and it <laughs> continues on like this. And, and I think it's acclamation. Now, you, I, I'm going to assume you read more bizarro than I do. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, yeah, I read quite, quite a lot of bizarro. Yeah. So I'm almost wondering if you're acclimated the other way, like you get into like a normal, like, like a book you would buy at the, I don't know, like off the shelf at Walmart or something, mm -hmm. or, you know, an airport bookstore. Like if you're like, oh my God, this is the most boring shit ever. Like it takes you a while to be able to get into a story that's not absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it definitely has become that because I've, I've read and in, in tomorrow um, all the time and, and going to that quote unquote normal book, picking up a Stephen King book. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's so just vanilla. <laughs> it's a kind of a, the, the word, the way to say it. And and those regular books are are so difficult for me to get back into, get into that that frame of mind. Like what's you know, I sit there like, what's fun about this? And there's nothing. Everything's boring. Everything's the way the world is. You know, there's there's not much. I don't know what you call it, like stimulus or something to 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 get me excited about the book. So books anymore that are not necessarily bizarre. I really need some kind of really crazy hook uh, or, or something to get me excited about them because bizarro has in a lot of ways tainted me like that. I will say that after a little bit, I, I was able to acclimate, mm -hmm. you know, pretty, pretty well, I think, and, and really kind of enjoy it. And, and it, you know, it reset my brain as to like what to expect through the rest of the book. So as things came up, I was able to enjoy them more than immediately yeah, that that part of my brain that says, "Oh fuck, this is goddamn ridiculous." And just in all honesty, that's just kind of how I felt. Especially, like I said, the the prologue was pretty straight. You get thrown this ridiculous, um, you know, uh, conglomeration. I think is a great way to put it, by the way, mm -hmm. of dolls essentially. Um, you know, and, and I go, okay, well, this is out there, but the fucking book's called Terror Mannequin. I had to expect something, right? But it was written so straight that it, it throws you off a little bit. But like I said, after after I acclimated to it, it uh, I felt that it went uh, that it was OK. Yeah. And especially with Douglas Hackle, because like, as you said, he he takes like that, you know, that workplace thing where he's trying to show you the 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 anti workplace or the fun workplace. But as in that bizarre style and then that really it's a very Douglas Hackle way of, of storytelling, too, where it's just 
to the utmost of absurdist level on things like you mentioned the the baby diaper changing it's like how do i make it ridiculous and then beyond ridiculous and he does this in every facet of the book and i think that's where you were talking about that that adjustment like okay it's not just fun for life he's ramping like everything up as you read through the book and 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 once you get adjusted to that um yeah you would hope that <laughs> okay i'm along for this ride i i see what he's doing now and part of why I brought Terra Madigan to you was because I've enjoyed his writing for so long now. And I often wonder how somebody not prepared or hasn't read Douglas Ackle before <laughs> would take this in because I read stuff like this. And I, I mean, I love it because I think it is like the, the, the high end of what, you know, Bizarro is doing. He's, he's just working in this really super bizarre level. And I, I don't know how the normal person would read that. So that was sort of, it's sort of an experiment <laughs> I was uh, performing on you to, to see if you could uh, wrap your head around all this or if I'm just that, that shit crazy myself. Well, I mean, those two don't have to be mutually exclusive, <laughs> I don't think necessarily. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so at any rate, so we, that's the first glimpse we get to see of Lamont and how frustrated and bored he is with all of this and how absurd he, he finds, not absurd, um, how boring he finds all of it. And I guess when it's your every day, that doesn't, uh, it isn't quite as titillating as it might be to us, the reader. So we get uh, a shot of his home life after that. So he lives uh, with his mother in an in a old family estate that's been in his, uh, in his family for generations. And his two freak nephews, um, which are mentioned in the, in the synopsis now, um, if you, you know, like I said, just as you think, okay, well, all right. So his workplace is, is pretty crazy, but they're, they're all like human beings. They're all, you know, just living this kind of crazy life. We're introduced to the two nephews, um, Tom too, who is perpetually either eons old or two years old. I guess I said that probably the wrong way. He's perpetually two years old or eons old, one of the two, because he's been two for a really, really long time. And he is... Uh, he looks a lot like uh, oh, I forget the the artist's name. Um, the the scream monk, the famous monk. kind of odd monk, munch, munch, <laughs> something like that. Sure, that that one. Ed, Edward. <laughs> so <Munch>. many. <laughs> that yeah. kind of can't be right, but it's close. Yeah. yeah. Um, like a like a tiny version of him, and then uh, I, you know I'd say his brother, but it's not really his brother. It's it's a creature known as the membrane, which I pictured as like that that slime. That, that like your kids play yeah. with, but in a in a much bigger um, format, and it can mold itself like loosely into different objects. So it can it can give you the middle finger, or it can um, you know pull two appendages out and clap that type of yeah. thing. Um, so those those are his nephews, and they've been with that family for a very very long time. And and his family, the 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 Lamonts, have have cared for them. And as I mentioned, he lives with his elderly mother, who's um, 92 years old. Um, she's also batshit crazy. Yes. Ma Ruth is, uh, oh man, I don't know. She has a, a sort of accent to her. It was, was it, is it sort of Southern? I couldn't place how the accent was. It was very like, yeah, it was very backwards. Like, um, like a, maybe a, a Joe Lansdale type of character backwards. Yeah, and and yep. she. Uh, I was gonna say southern, but not in that not in that proper southern way. No, not at all. She resembles, as she's described very closely, Freddy Krueger. She's all scarred up and burned, and and pretty nasty looking. And then she's got that that hillbilly sort of drawl to her. And she's uh, another another batshit crazy person living in that house. And we are approaching Halloween. The townspeople of Salosa, Pennsylvania. Um, absolutely hate the Lamont family, and that's uh, primarily because of Tom Two and the membrane. Uh, they're uh, weird freaks that live in town, so that the you know, I mean, they get the they don't go out at all because the teasing and the threats of violence are too much. But you know, they basically become the house that I don't think it's stated in the book, but the neighbor neighborhood kids egg, and you know, they have weird rhymes and stuff that they you know chant about uh, Tom Two and the membrane. But through some deal that I don't quite understand. At some point, the town came to an agreement with the Lamont family that if they stayed out of the public eye and then they went reverse trick or treat every year, that they would be left alone, at least not, um, you know, not, not, uh, 
not have their lives threatened or any violence come to them. So the process of reverse trick or treating is they have to go to every single house in the town by uh, 10 p.m. and deliver candy to every house. So normal kids go to houses to get candy. Um, Tom two and the membrane have to do um, the exact opposite. Yeah, and and they have to they have to give the candy, and in addition to that, they have to take any kind of insults, ribbing, uh, and and just bad mouthing while they're at each house uh, you know without without question they 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 leave the candy and then it's up to it's up to the the prerogative of the each household member if they like to further belittle um, lamont and tom too and the membrane and they just have to sit there and take it until they are, are free to go and move on and that's part of the thing and like you said it's it's a ritual and bad thing like they will get strung up and hung uh, by the townspeople if they don't do this and cover every single house uh, by 10 o'clock on Halloween night. The town is very hostile to the Lamont family, and I know you mentioned it, it kind of in passing. Um, the the other nemesis, the 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 villain in this, and I, I, I don't have his name in my notes, is um, Glant's boss, who has been bullying him since high school. So he was the blonde-haired jock that stuck Lamont in a locker kind of thing, and that goes on. Um, to today, uh, the problem is the Fund for Life Corporation pays very, very, very well. So if Glant doesn't bend to his boss's every whim, he'll be fired and he won't be able to support his elderly mother and his two freak freakish nephews. So at one point, he's forced to actually get his name changed to my weak ass little bitch. <laughs> my tiny little weak bitch. Yeah, that's it. Yep. So it, it he's forced to do ridiculous things. And now, on top of all of that, the townspeople are, are very hostile to his family. It's Halloween night. It's their um, mandated walk of shame night. Um, but another, another uh, you know, uh, wrench has been thrown into the works. The, the house at Falling Water um, has been reopened. Nobody knows how, but all the barbed wire is gone. All the keep out signs are gone. And that is now considered a residence. And they will have to go there on a boat. Mm -hmm. and potentially face the terror mannequin. I think that's about all we could say about kind of like story, you know, plotting. But um, <laughs> I got to say, this fucking town, you have the terror mannequin, which you described. Um, we kind of talked about Tom 2 and the membrane. But there are other like weird supernatural beings that live in this town. And it's all kind of just taken in by the townsfolk. Like... <sighs> There's a character I want to talk about, and it's a little weird, right? So Tom 2 and the Membrane are complete outcasts, although Tom 2 is like the sweetest thing in the world, and the Membrane's kind of a smartass, but really only if you speak sign language, because that's the only way you can communicate is through, you know, globby appendages. Um, but, you know, there's another character in the town that has a, a bizarre supernatural ability, and, and I'll let you pick if we're going too far to talk about the, the one of the other female characters in this. Nobody seems to have a problem with her, though. Well, they shouldn't because yeah. they, you know, <laughs> they could wind up in a bad, yeah. a bad position. Do we, do we yeah, want to I mean, talk about I'm okay her a little with bit? doing it. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. I don't th I think that it's, I think it would probably be a good way to describe some of the other supernatural elements in the book. Yeah. Well, because there's really two characters that, that come to the story after, after that point where, you know, falling water opens back up and, you know, um, they're, the the one you're talking to, I want to. It's got to be Mahi's making eyes at me. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, Mahi's making eyes at me is a. I guess she's a secondary, even a tertiary character. That uh, the her whole thing is, if you look at her for more than a second directly in the eye, she will scream out, "Mahi's making eyes at me," and then her invisible mother <laughs> comes and and just rips you to shreds and kills you. And you get attacked by an invisible being that you can't see. And so everybody in the town has to avert their eyes from her. Uh, otherwise, she'll scream out those words, Mahi's making eyes at me, and uh, the, the invisible mother will come and kill you. And it's, just, it's a very sort of mythological type of a, a, a character. And the character's name is what she calls out. And, um, <laughs> a, a, you know, <laughs> she plays a part in the whole thing. But uh, yeah, she's just a, it's a very typical <laughs> thing in Douglas Hackle's world. He has characters that are 
absolutely like nuts, like the membrane, like Tom too, who's both old and ancient at the same time. It's very typical uh, when you read Doug ha Douglas Hackle's books. He had um, in one book, the, the, the War of 1812 was a character in, in one of his short stories. In one of another short stories, the drum fill from Phil Collins in the air tonight is an actual character. He loves to take, I've never, you know, there's always that personification of an animal or an inanimate object, but Hackle in his classic technique of just completely ramping the oddness and the absurdity to the next level just takes concepts <laughs> and, and, and turns them into characters. And it's, it's one of those things that I absolutely adore about his writing. So I, I would say my he's making eyes at me for me is actually, uh, you know, a physical being. So it's like a lesser kind of weirdness for me as a character. But she's such a it's such a great sort of a thing uh, to do with a character. And, and and she has that that two layer thing, like the weirdness of you can't let, look at her. She'll call us out. And then she has this invisible mother that then comes and kill you. And she's like a two part sort of character. Yep. Um, also, I will say this. I'm going to give him some credit. She um, dresses like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz and kind of looks like Judy Garland. So yeah. that to me means she's the hottest chick in the book. Ooh, okay. Just put that out there. Just a little personal, little personal thing there. Um, you know, Judy Garland, not hot, really? I, I didn't Nothing. say that. I didn't say that. All right. Okay. All right. I was just checking. <laughs> I, was, I, don't know if I'm way, I don't know if I'm way off base here or not. No. So. <laughs> the only other character that that I think we're gonna we're gonna mention, and just kind of in passing, because Chillington, the chill master of Chillville, yeah, who, as you might imagine, is just one of the chillest guys in the world. Um, Chillville is an actual place in this book, although we don't visit it, we do hear about it, and that's from where uh, that's where Chillington hails from. So there's a, a pretty interesting uh, story be behind that too. So yeah. Fucking bat shit craziness, man. I don't, I don't like. I don't think we can say much more about the story. Just know that we touched on the insanity. Mm -hmm. We didn't, we didn't go terribly deep on it. No, and it's a, it's a, an intricate web that is weaved from the, from that point that we left off at into the, the rest of the story. For sure. Um, a couple of notes that I jotted down, um, much like you know the Julie Garland esque Ma. He's making eyes at me, being um, you know hot. Uh, I don't know what he's got for Totinos, but <laughs> I, I have to say this: I, I don't know if I've ever divulged this on the podcast. Totinos party pizzas are my favorite thing in the whole world. Wow! Like, given my choice of anything to eat, you know, you know, barring like, you know, if you said, "Hey, do you want to go out for a steak or stay home and have a Totinos?" I'm gonna opt for the steak. But I mean, as far as like being at home, I am always, always happy with the Totinos party pizza. That warmed my heart. That the membrane also felt the same way about Totinos party pizzas. Yeah, he lives on them. Yeah, I could do that. I could live on them. And they're cheap, dude. Like, if you catch them on sale, they're like a buck a piece. Yeah. It's amazing. Amazing value <laughs> for amazing food source. And that's Totino's is, if you read Hackle, he's he's constantly bringing up Totino's, too. So he must have the same love as you and the membrane do for Totino's pizzas. Yeah, I, I will. I will say this. I was a little alarmed, and I know that this is a fiction book, but he predicted something kind of terrible for the Totino's Corporation towards the end of the book. That was, to be honestly, more horrifying than <laughs> terror mannequins and Mahi's making eyes at me and 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 all that. So um, it was nice. But he also mentions the pizza rolls. I guess I can go this far. The terror mannequin can cause your heart to turn into <laughs> basically a Totino's pizza roll, mm -hmm. and I. Uh, they're just sentences that when you hear yourself say them out loud, you're like, how the fuck did I get to this place in my life where I just said that? And I, I just had one of those moments. It was it was in the coroner's report, so it is an official cause of death. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm glad you brought that up, too, because he does break the fourth wall a number of times mm -hmm. um, in this and talks directly to the audience. But again, once you get past the weirdness of reading this type of book, you know, it just it fits and it makes sense. And he does it in such a way that even though it's it's, you know, completely absurd, you, you can't help but smile at some of these things and maybe even chuckle out loud. 
And I have to give him credit for that because it, it takes a special talent to take something so fucking ridiculous and, and make it funny for somebody who like, I don't even watch like comedy movies. You, you know what I mean? So I'm not just laughing and chuckling at, at everything that's thrown my way. So, so there's definitely a talent that goes into being able to pull that out of people. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely, I don't know if you find this too, but I find when I read his stuff, especially like, like with Chillington, the Chillmeister of Chillville, there's a sort of cadence to the prose, the way he writes things like, like that, there's this repetition and, and I don't know, it comes almost like a cadence and a, and a, a metering in a way mm -hmm. uh, of the way he writes in within that absurdity. It's like you're reading this batshit craziness, but there's just something almost, almost literary about the whole thing. You know, it's, it seems very deliberate. It is for sure. And, and that's the thing, like, you know, when I say it's well-written, it's well-written. Yeah. But it's written because of the subject matter. That's, that's harder, I think, to see than just reading like really solid prose. Mm -hmm. Because they're reading really solid prose about Totino's um, pizza roll hearts and fucking eons old two year olds that look like the screen. You know what I mean? It's it's harder to identify that the writing is very good than it would be, perhaps, if Douglas wrote uh, an actual book on on the War of eighteen twelve versus having it be a character opposite Phil Collins' drum fill. Do you know what I like? Do you get what I'm saying? I know. Exactly, yeah. exactly what you're saying. And I mean, I, I, I might be slightly off base here, but I'm, I'm almost positive Douglas Hackle graduated as a like an English major of some sort. So like he knows <laughs> his stuff. You are, you are not off base at all because I want to talk about that, too. I think we'll save okay. it for a little bit, a little bit later. Fair uh, enough. Fair enough. Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a, a method to the madness that that you you can pick apart as you're reading this and you know it's as as much as you're like I, I can't believe this counts at the same time you're like this is this is beautiful <laughs> and it's it's really crazy to to experience for sure is there anything else you'd like to say before we get into uh into a wrap-up on this book anything about the story or the writing or anything uh not too much i did want to like point out i don't know if you were aware of this of that that the falling water house is a real actual place um, oh, yeah, it is. I, I actually went and, and Frank Lloyd Wright obviously is a, 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 he's a famous architect and Falling Water is an actual house in Pennsylvania that you can go and visit. And it does indeed have a a river that runs through it. And I, I couldn't really find pictures too much of the inside. Uh, but but uh, it seems the description of, of people taking canoes inside uh, are not too far off. It doesn't have, as it's described in the book, they, they you know, people would go in and, and trick or treat inside with the original owner. And then he had, there's a waterfall that empties out, the river empties out of the house in a waterfall, but he also had a little gate that would swing over to a, a water slide. And that was the fun part. He would close off the waterfall and everybody go down their water slide in their boats. And um, there's no water, <laughs> there's no water slide, but there is a waterfall that comes out of the house. And it's, actually a very real place i thought that was kind of important to note in this in this world of insanity that douglas ackles created that one of the one of the sort of uh centerpiece uh ge like geographical locations is actually real i'm glad that you did point it out because it never occurred to me <laughs> that, you know what i mean like in this book <laughs> In any other book, I might have Googled it. I'll be honest. Yeah. In this book, I was like, yeah, all right, fucking Jesus Christ. So, <laughs> so wait, so you're saying the house is real, but terror mannequin? Was there anything about a mannequin? Uh, you know, I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of the terror mannequin. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who reads this book will understand that that last little bit. So, um, I, I'm... Would you like to do a wrap up and give this some some stars, or would you like me to go first? Uh, why don't you take the lead and then uh, and then I'll follow it up. Um, I've read, I don't know, twelve, twenty, whatever bizarro books um, over the course of my life. 
um, I always suffer from this problem of having, uh, it takes me a little while to, to adjust to just completely bizarre uh, bullshit that happens in, in these books. Um, but once you do that, I, I find that they're, um, they're a nice way to, to cleanse the palate, right? To be reminded that you can um, enjoy a story that's not uh, super literary or doesn't pose an actual mystery or, you know, isn't whatever it is you normally read, super actiony or romantic, erotic, whatever, um, that you can get out of your own head in a way through works like this one by, uh, by Douglas Hackle. Um, I, I, I wonder if one day I'll be able to crack one open and, and, and get into it right away and see how that kind of impacts my, my reading ability. But I think that he wove together a story that was really oddly charming. Um, I'm a big fan of Tom too. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought a lot of the stuff that he put forth that he meant to be funny delivered. Mm -hmm. Like it delivered and was genuinely funny in the most ridiculous way. I looked up some, I, I was looking for a bio because there is a bio in the book, as I mentioned, but I chose to go with the other crazy bio that I found online, maybe on Goodreads or something. Um, and, 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 you know, and I saw a number of people call him the most absurd writer in Bizarro. And I mean, I don't have a ton of experience to base it off of, but I would say seems, seems pretty fucking legit. Um, I really enjoyed this book. And I think, um, I, I honestly think, if you've never read a Bizarro book, I think this might be the one that you should grab. So uh, I'm going to give this book four and a half stars. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so in, in, in contrast to you, I have read bunches and bunches of heaps of Bizarro, including Douglas Hackle. I think uh, mostly everything, certainly all of his major releases, I've read already. So Terror Mannequin comes in for me as, as a definite, I recognize all those Douglas Hackle tropes and, and this delivered in a, in a new way. I see, I actually see a maturing of his writing. Uh, this one is a little more darker than his previous uh, offerings and a little more horror based than his previous offerings, believe it or not. And so it was it was something a little bit new, but he likes to have, as I've said before, his characters are, go beyond personification of, of animals or objects. They go personifying it, uh, concepts, and it's it's really crazy. And and that that next level absurdity that he brings to everything he writes is really what I love most about his writing. And it's all here in Terror Mannequin. So. Um, I have to say, this is not my most favorite Douglas Hackle book, but I still love it as a Douglas Hackle book. I think, Livius, that you were dead on. Anybody who hasn't read Bizarro is kind of interested um, or, or has re read very little. Terra Mannequin is a, is a really good book to pick up because there's some Bizarro books that are way out there, and I would never recommend for people to pick up as their first Bizarro offering because they're just really too much. This one is, is, is so bizarro crazy, but I think it's still, it's still attainable to read for people who are not used to it. And it's probably at the, at the high end of that. It's really a good showpiece for what bizarro can be. So all in all, I thoroughly enjoyed Terra Mannequin, and I am going to give it four stars. Very good, sir. I'm not done talking about this book, no. though. Kind of. There's a couple other things. I mentioned the title earlier, so I just want to follow up on that. I recently, I had the same thought. I don't know if I mentioned it on the, the podcast. We reviewed um, the drive through Crematorium, which is also a, a bizarro book. Uh, and and I, I felt the title was a little misplaced um, because we didn't spend the, the... How do I say this? So I pick up a book called drive through Crematorium. And I think to myself that the centerpiece of this book should be a crematorium that you drive through. I don't know what it is, but that's kind of what comes to mind when I read that. And um, I, I, although there was a drive through crematorium, it was uh, really, in my opinion, a small part of the book. So I, I, I don't want to say misleading, but I think misplaced is probably a, a little bit of a better term. Kind of a little bit felt the same way about the title Terror mm -hmm. Mannequin. And it occurred to me, and I'm not going to say why, but I really, really thought 
I was about three quarters through the book and I said, you know, I think what he should have called this book is Salosa PA. Wow. And I feel like that would have encompassed, so it wouldn't have been as grabbing mm -hmm. of a title. I'll say that Tara Mankin jumps off the fucking shelf at you, but I feel that it would have been better served as, as a title. I, um, to I, I got to agree with you in the, in the tone, I think of what he was trying to set by using the title Terra Mannequin. That just Salosa PA yep. would have done it and been more true to the entire book. I do have to, to tell you, I, I had an opportunity on Bazong to interview Douglas a few months ago ahead of the release of this book. And uh, he, he told me, he explained on the podcast that he was, he was teetering on the title of the book. He wasn't sure at the time whether he was going to just call it Terra Mannequin or he had his original title was going to be Terra Mannequin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that was delightful All because right. that's, a, that's a very quote unquote tackle type of title. Yeah. But if you read the book, yep. it's, it makes even more sense. <laughs> and I, but I don't know if that, I felt, I, I really wish he would have, you know, having even before I read it, wish he had used that, that longer title. But, uh, I guess in the end, he, he explained like he just wanted something simple. And he was really trying to hone in when I interviewed him about the book. He was trying to hone in on the the more horror aspect of, of this book as opposed to his previous work. So, uh, you know, that that was, I guess, always Terra Mannequin in his mind. But I like your idea of Stelosa PA. Yeah, yeah. I um I think and, and you'll probably be able to speak to this a little more eloquently. I almost feel and, and we're still gonna talk about Douglas Hackle because I want to talk about this mm -hmm. this college thing that you were talking about, but while we're on titles, as I think through titles of, of bizarro books, it feels like 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 you almost have to make it an over the top title. Um and and in so many cases, and we can go back to like original like Carlton Mellick stuff, right? The, the baby Jesus butt plug, you know, I mean, like there's a title that, that jumps off the shelf at you and you go, what the fuck is this? And do you find that in Bizarro more than another fiction, the titles tend to be um, very in your face um, where, you know, maybe every other fucking genre in the world, <laughs> like the titles are far more subdued. Yeah, it, it's, it's very true of Bizarro, but I think it actually in, in the last few years, even it, it, the titles have gone away from that even and and they aren't as shocking as you know the baby jesus butt plug or or uh, uh the uh goblins goblins ask as, as goblins of auschwitz yeah ask goblins of auschwitz which is the most bizarro book i've ever read it's the most bizarro title um more recently carlton Mellick had uh and you reviewed it uh every time we meet at the dairy queen your whole fucking face explodes um but I think more recently that someone's making that into a fucking, I know film. how is this even possible? Isn't that incredible. But that title, that Amazing. title is, is, is so bizarro. And, but I just don't think we see that lately. And I don't know if it's um, a symptom of every bizarro book being that insane and in your face and, and vulgar and, and attention grabbing. And, and the titles do seem to me to be a little, a lot more subtle lately. So uh, and and I just don't I don't know if that's just a symptom of having been over the top constantly to stand out. Now you have to make your your title a little less uh, grabbing, I you know, or 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 you're just running out of ways to be vulgar in a title. I'm not sure what that all is, but there have been people that have have noted that that movement away from those those really attention grabbing titles. In my head, I was doing this this exercise, and I was like, "Man, what if every other genre took on the same kind of titling mm -hmm. thing?" You know, so you can amuse yourself for hours thinking about you know romance, uh, romance books. You know, you know, we met and fucked in an alley is like the title of like the next Harlequin book. You know, or um, we kill crazy ass terrorists as some type of, you know, action special forces book or something like it, it could extend out pretty far. Just think about some Stephen King titles. Yeah. That, that could go from like it to fucking crazy supernatural clown face would be like the new title of it. 
So at any rate, I found that kind of kind of interesting. It is, it is, and and um, even Douglas Hackle has like the hottest gay man ever killed in a shark attack is the title of a of a book. He has those very grabbing titles like that as well. And so Terror Mannequin is a is a step away from that too as well. So this dude received a BA in English literature from John Carroll University, which I which I, I thought was interesting. I don't know that I think that somebody with an, uh, a literature degree shouldn't write Bizarro, but like it, I don't know how to frame this. And again, you're, you're probably the perfect as a writer and as somebody who talks to a lot of people through Bizong that are in the Bizarro community. There's something really cool about um, Bizarro and, and maybe I'm getting it all wrong, <laughs> but I have, uh, there's a few writers that I, I'm, you know, friends with that communicate with either via email or in person or whatever. And for them, being a successful writer is very important. Mm -hmm. So they very often, and, and I'll say, I won't say who, but I, I got an email from someone that was asking if, you know, Hey, what do you think about this book and how this book is doing for someone, you know, and, and, you know, they didn't mean like, what do you think of the book? Or do you think people like the book? It was like, what kind of numbers do you think this guy is putting up? And I imagine Hackle went, got a degree in English literature. I'm just going to assume that when you do that, you're kind of a writer at heart. I could be wrong. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a college degree, right? But it occurred to me that somebody who goes into Bizarro pretty much understands that the measure of success is a little mm -hmm. different. Like, I don't think somebody sits down to write Terror Mannequin and thinks, this is the one I'm going to get to a fucking agent and I'm going to be on the New York Times bestseller list where a crime writer or a mystery writer, even even a more, you know, we'll say mainstream horror writer probably has that dream. But then they feel like they failed if and when it doesn't happen. And I just imagine that the Bizarro community um, writes these stories for the love of writing them. And that for them, yeah, you know, Douglas Hackle's thinking, man, I might sell 1500 copies of this book. Maybe that's a measure of success for him. I, I have no idea. But I feel like it's a less business minded decision to write Bizarro than it might be for someone who's writing fucking virtually any other any other genre. You're you're 100 percent correct. I know when I first started Bizong and first started in, intensively interviewing Bizarro author after Bizarro author, you know, it, it was sort of I found in, in retrospect, the thing I was picking at was, you know, what's bizarre to you? How do you how do you rate your success? You know, what are you doing marketing wise and all this? And then, you know, so often is the case. Yes, there there is this sort of understanding that uh, we're not going to make millions of dollars. We're not going to make thousands of dollars in mo most cases. Um, and there is no there is no sort of person on the top. You got Carlton Millick there up at top. Um, uh, books like skullcrack city that have kind of gained some crossover appeal outside of bizarro but still in all they're not those those mega things and you know i, I don't think i can't imagine anybody goes into writing bizarro to aspire to to live solely as an author writing bizarro i don't i don't really think it exists too much it i i could be wrong i don't know i think carlton mellick that's all he does is writes uh, but he's definitely the exception mm -hmm. to the rule. And uh, so often the story is when I interview all these authors, it's, uh, you know, I've been, this is what I'm writing. It gets rejected everywhere. I don't know what to do with it. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, I read, I read a Carlton Mellon book. I read, I even, I read Chuck Palahniuk and that leads me down this hole into Bizarro and, and I find a Bizarro and all of a sudden they read their first Bizarro book and they're like, this is what I'm writing. This is where I need to be. And it's like, they find, you know, their niche, they find their, their tribe and, and, and come into Bizarro. And it's like, it's like the only thing they know how to write <laughs> and they don't know how to write or they refuse to write any kind of mainstream thing with a broad appeal. It's, this is what's in my heart. I guess they're all artists at heart and they just uh, are dedicated to that. They're not going to write to, to the audience. They're not going to write to, the trend of, of what's being read, they're going to write what they want to write. And what's coming out is this weird stuff. And 
thank God there's Bizarro because I have nowhere else to, to share this with the world. But at least in this tiny little Bizarro community, uh, there's a whole tribe of people that are, are into this and enjoy it. And, uh, and they're happy to be there because of it. Yeah. And I, I think there's something very cool about that. And it's, I, I don't know how to equate it to, to something else. It's, it's almost like somebody who paints just for themselves. Right. So, and I'm not saying obviously they have an audience and, and there's a, you know, a, a small percentage, but still a large group of people that buy, read and enjoy these books, but it's the not catering to anybody. And just being true to yourself. And and like I said, I, I know a handful of people and, you know, their question when they're writing a book is, how do I get this? How do I get an mm -hmm. agent to represent me? And then how do I get write this book so that that agent can sell it to a big five so I can sell the movie rights to the book? And I have no problem with people do it like that's like that's totally cool. Most of my favorite books have probably gone through that process yeah. before they wound up on my desk. But I think there's something really, really cool about somebody who says, you know what? I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. I'm going to write the book the best way I know how. I also imagine that they're not impeded by editors in the same way. Because, you know, just imagine that this book, Terror Mannequin, made it to, you know, a, a top <laughs> five publisher, right? Can you imagine the editorial process Yeah, where they're like, well, you know... We can't, we can't, Tom too can't look too much like the scream. Like we can say he kind of looks like the scream, but yeah. uh, y you know what I mean? Like this is just balls out. Like here it is. And then the editing process is probably like, Hey, learn to use commas or, you know, this, uh, you mentioned something in chapter eight that refers back to something that clearly didn't happen in the book. And you go, Oh fuck. Yeah. I, I forgot to, to add that back. You know what I mean? That type of, um, thing. So I don't know. I, I, I have a, a respect for them um, as artists, because, and I hate to say it, but I, I think that by and large, that that's, that's the highest level of success they'll achieve is being able to be happy with their work. Um, it would be nice for it to be different. I think you're right. I think Carlton Mellick um, just writes, but I think he also has mm -hmm. to put out like four or five books a year in order to do that, which yeah. is a ton of yeah. work. And, and to your point about like the editor is, is so spot on because in my own writing, even though I don't consider myself, necessarily a bizarre writer certainly what i write is is weird and, and not normal but uh i didn't i didn't even expect it until i had i knew because i'm self-published uh but i do turn my work over to and i hire an editor freelance uh, to edit my work that's just what you have to do and it, i quickly realized like i can't just hire any editor i need an editor that can wrap their head around the the weird stuff because uh, you know, they're going to want to make corrections that I don't think need to be made. And they, because they don't need to, they don't understand the sort of the weird angle. And I, I had it when I was first submitting short stories to anthologies and stuff and people were trying to change things. I'm like, no, no, no that's really what I meant. And it does, we're not going to change that. So when it came time to hire an editor for, for my own standalone work, that, that was definitely something I had to take into consideration. And I had to shop around for uh, bizarro minded editors. And I, until the, I have one book in with an editor now, and it was another process of who's best going to be able to wrap their mind around this. I put a call out on Facebook and had, I don't know, 50 names plus dropped to me. And really of those 50 names, I think there were only three that I thought would have been capable of, of, of doing the job justice, I think. So it's a, it's a small pool <laughs> of those editors and people who can even, you know, do those books justice and, and, and the business of putting out a bizarre book. It is still a business and people like Rose O'Keefe, they, they, I can tell you, I guarantee you, she is definitely thinking of, of, uh, you know, the movie deals and is this right and everything. She is doing her dandest to put out a book every bit as good as a penguin book or a hatchet book. You know, she, she's, out there doing the work she she goes to all these publishing seminars she acts like a big publisher she is by no means just some sort of you know somebody running or almost a vanity press she is completely dead serious about publishing and eraser head uh even if that book is uh, every time we meet at the dairy queen your whole fucking face explodes she believes in that book as much as a stephen king book 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the nicest person too. We had her on the podcast a, a few years ago. And I'll be honest, I don't know if the term bizarro would exist if it wasn't for her. So I think that um, all bizarre writers and readers owe her a debt of gratitude. And I've thought that for a really long time. Absolutely. 100%. Great conversation about all that stuff, man. Tell me what's going on with you. Uh, well, like I said, I got a, I got a book in now. I'm hoping to get out by the end of the year. Um, it's, it's a departure for me. Typically I'm horror comedy. That's where I lie. It's got hints of bizarro always, but I'm never purely bizarro. Um, and this one, this one's called cat coin and it's something that's been for the last couple of years, I've been entranced by Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Uh, so much so that I, there, I came to a point where I was watching all these documentaries, reading all these books on it. Um, I don't have a million dollars to invest in one Bitcoin, but uh, I just, I'm just, I, there's such a romantic concept about the whole thing that I'm like, I need, I need to write a book about this myself. So I took that, uh, that love of, of cryptocurrency, everything. And I just turned it into the, you know, the whole idea of like, people have the hardest time wrapping their mind of, how is this money and it doesn't exist? And I'm like, well, you, really anything can have value and be called money. So I just took the concept and said, you know, there's stray cats all over the world. <laughs> what if people just took cats and turned cats into money one day? And I just kind of retold the story of Bitcoin using cats. And then cat coin was born. Oh, I'm and sure Satoshi. <laughs> it's, no, it's Katoshi Nakamoto. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm sure Satoshi is super proud. We'll be super proud of this of this venture. It sounds it sounds really cool. Yeah, um, yeah I find the same thing. Like the ins and outs of cryptocurrency are uh, they're confusing to people, and I think you relay it the best way. That literally, why does gold have any value? Only because we were willing to trade goods and services for it, and then eventually paper money replaced you know whatever gold is the standard that we mm -hmm. traded. Um, and it could have been cats or, you know, a, a different type of, of rock instead of gold. It could have been, you know, slate or something that had value. So, yeah, absolutely. And cats, of all things, I'm very allergic to cats. Um, so I would not do well in your in your uh, weird future <laughs> cryptocurrency world. But I'll also say that so many crypto coins have come out that um, it just you could have you probably would have had as easy a time developing your own cryptocurrency <laughs> as you would like writing a book re you know reworking it editing it and then publishing it yeah that's so true and that was i mean half of the battle as i'm writing this like it's constantly changing the, the history of it the, the story of cryptocurrency is changes by the day so you know that's half the problem is the research you look at a book from 2016 and it's it's really ancient text now as, as far as the technology is concerned yeah yeah because facebook is going to get a cryptocurrency they're going to use it to pay their people or something i don't yeah i'm not really sure i haven't looked too far what what is there do you remember what their crypto coin is going to be called they're, they're libra libra that's it yeah 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 not sure uh not sure how well that's going to go over but uh keep waiting for the government to come down on cryptocurrency like any fucking day well they can't it's decentralized. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Tell that to the China, tell that to the Chinese government, right? Yeah. Well, then they're, they're not happy. What's happening with Bazong? Give us a, give us an update on where Bazong, you're at there. Yeah. 180 plus episodes strong. Everybody is still uh, aghast that I was able to make <laughs> a bizarro based podcast last 180 plus episodes. I have one, um, in the can now with a very big writer. Uh, it was meant to be out, uh, this past Monday, but it'll be out uh, next Monday because of some personal issues I had. Uh, but a, a really big writer, not necessarily somebody of Bizarro, but um, I, I couldn't turn my back on his request to be interviewed on Bazong. So stick around for that. But I'm always, always, always week after week interviewing everybody who has anything to do uh, with Bizarro fiction. And it's it's been a labor of love. And uh, I'm still shocked to this day that... Uh, I've made it last 180 episodes that I get as many people listening as I do. And, and when I go out to conventions and stuff, you know, when somebody walks up to me, I've never met and says, hi, Mr. Frank, I know immediately they, they are a zonger as I call people who listen to the song and I'm floored by the people who walk up to me and say, Hey, Mr. Frank. And it, it's pretty amazing what doing the little podcast 
all by myself in a basement as has become. One day he'll be allowed to do that podcast on the first floor. One day, but that'll be up to my wife and nobody else. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like I'm all I'm my, I'm my own boss, except for my yeah. wife. That's, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> anything else you want to talk about before we get out of here. You know, really, that's that's all I've got going on right now. This this time of year is, is nice and quiet, and the holidays are buckling down. But there's there's always episodes of Bazong every Monday. Just you know, everybody knows how to Google, and it's a uh, part of the Project Entertainment Network of podcasts. How many podcasts are on there now? I remember when that was like two podcasts. They were up to about 25, I think, at one point. Now we're back down somewhere just under 25. It's like 17 or 18. Not bad at all. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to commend you on staying out of the, the recent news about Cheezine magazine. Oh, thank you. I was yeah. listening to your latest episode before <laughs> before we, we got on, and I thought to myself, I'm kind of glad Rob's out of town because I don't think I want to talk about this shit either. <laughs> I would have felt compelled to if we were a little more timely on it. So, yeah, yeah, there's no good reason to talk about it. Anything that's been said about cheesing has been said, and, and uh, I think it's crystal clear what the situation is. Well, Frank, thank you again for filling in for Rob. I'm sure that Rob appreciated the extended break he had from me, and uh, he was able to do that because of you. So thanks a lot, buddy. Anytime I can fill Rob's big shoes, it's, uh, it's an absolute treat. All right, excellent. Help me take this out, man. Until next time, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Mr. Frank. Keep reading. <laughs>